Good evening and welcome. What a wonderful crowd. Your attendance here tonight makes this the largest legislative briefing in the history of the University of Minnesota. And this isn't even everyone. We are being joined by the university supporters all across the state of Minnesota by video at three of our coordinate campuses. I'd like to give a special welcome to those advocates joining us from University of Minnesota Crookston, University of Minnesota Morris, and University of Minnesota Duluth. We are glad you could be with us tonight and excited about all you do and the presence you provide for the university throughout all of Minnesota. The legislative briefing is about more than one night. It's about kicking off a season of strong advocacy and leveraging the citizen groups who work tirelessly to support the University of Minnesota. I'm aware of several groups who arrange meetings specifically around this event. They did so on purpose to fire up and organize their membership to be strong voices for the U of M at the legislature. I'll give you two examples. The College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences Alumni Society Board met immediately before the briefing tonight to ensure that their alumni are engaged, informed, and equipped to speak up in, the support, in support of the U. Thank you, CFAN's Alumni Society. The University of Minnesota Extension organized its regional directors, administrative staff, and citizen leaders from all across Minnesota to attend the briefing here in the Twin Cities tonight. As I understand it, this group of almost 60 university supporters is here tonight and has leveraged this event by scheduling visits with their legislators tomorrow at the Capitol. This group represents a cross-section of community leaders who understand the university's value to Minnesota, regardless of what part of the state you live in. Thank you, U of M Extension team. Down in front, we also have another group of committed volunteers to the University of Minnesota. I'd like to welcome and introduce the members of the Board of Regents that are with us this evening. Please stand when I say your name, and we'll save our applause until the end. Regent Stephen Hunter. Regent Maureen Ramirez, Regent David Larson, Regent Linda Cohen, Regent Venora Hung, Regent Richard Beeson, and Regent Dallas Bonsack. Thank you for your service to the UFM and being here tonight. And finally, the legislative briefing wouldn't be complete without the legislatures. Let's give a warm welcome to Senator Ted Daly from District 38. Thanks for being here, Senator. My name is Arturo Tuzju, and as a national chair of the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, it's such a pleasure to be in the role of welcoming you all to this annually anticipated event. Don't worry, I will not repeat Rick Gervais's performance during the recent Golden Globes Award program. <laughs> Mr. Burnix, you don't have to uh, worry. Each year, we seem to set a new registration record. Last year, we had 400 guests statewide, and this year, we have 525 guests here tonight. The increase in the number of guests peaks to the serious situation in our state and the future of a quality higher education system is facing, as well as the commitment that so many people in our state have to this institution of higher learning. The Alumni Association has been convening this event along with university relations for over two decades. We think it's vitally important for the university supporters to learn firsthand about the university's legislative agenda and to unite in our commitment to higher education and the University of Minnesota. Before I introduce our first speaker, please silence your ringer and any tones your cell phones may make as a courtesy to our speakers and other guests. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce 
fellow UFM alum, Peggy Flanagan, BA 2002. Peggy is a member of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe and director of the Native American Leadership Program for Wealthstone Action. She is also a former member of the Minneapolis Board of Education. I think you'll be moved as you listen to Peggy speak about the impact the university has had on her life. She has many years of experience as a community organizer and trainer, working with ordinary people to become effective, confident advocates in the political arena. Peggy knows from personal experience how citizens who become willing and able to speak up for what they believe in can make a difference in the political process. Let's give a gopher welcome to Peggy. Thank you. Buju, Peggy Flanagan and Dijna Kaz, Guabagin and Ganikag and Junchaba, Ming and Dendodame. My name is Peggy Flanagan. I'm a member of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe, and my family is the Wolf Clan. It's important that I introduce myself to you that way so you know a little bit about me, where I come from. The role of the Wolf Clan is to be the protectors of the community. I take that role very seriously in the work that I do with Native communities all across the country and with ordinary citizens, ordinary folks just like yourselves who can come together to make extraordinary differences in their own communities. So I shouldn't be standing up here in front of you. Some of you may have seen a recent article in the Minneapolis Star and Tribune that put my high school GPA on the front page of the variety section. It was a 1.75. Um, not my proudest moment in academic achievement. Uh, I went to school in St. Louis Park. Uh, my mom decided that we were gonna move there because of their amazing school system. It was my mom and I against the world, and it's still my mom and I against the world. Um, but when I went to school, something was missing. I felt different. You know, growing up, a lot of folks said, you know, oh, yeah, Peggy Flanagan, she's Jewish. Right? And I'm like, no, I'm Ojibwe. And they're like, right, Jewish. And I'm like, no, they're different. Um, but I think I went to more bar and bat mitzvahs than any other Ojibwe uh, person in the state of Minnesota. Um, but something was always missing. I never felt like a whole person. I knew that being Ojibwe was something that I didn't have in common with a lot of the other students at St. Louis Park. I knew that I wasn't fully connected to what it meant to be Ojibwe, what it meant to be Anishinaabe. And there was always this hole and there was this, always this gap for me. And I did well in speech class. I did well in music, uh, in choir. Some of you may think I look remarkably similar to that girl from Glee. Right? Okay. Uh, and I did well in those classes where teachers took a personal interest in who I was as a young woman of color. And unfortunately, those teachers were few and far between. So like I said, I shouldn't be standing here. And it was the University of Minnesota that actually gave me the opportunity to really find out who I was and to reach my full potential. I went to St. Cloud State my freshman year. I'm going to be as polite as possible and say it wasn't a good fit. Um, I used, uh, utilized the University of Minnesota Extension System and took three courses in Extension to prove myself worthy to attend the University of Minnesota. 
and I did quite well in all those classes and was admitted to the university and finished out my academic career right here in the Twin Cities. The first day that I walked into a classroom and saw a teacher who looked like me was my sophomore year of college. That teacher was Dr. Brenda Child from the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe. All of a sudden, I was inspired. I became a sponge. I wanted to know everything. And for the very first time, I was surrounded by other students who looked like me. I also had a teacher who's still here, Professor Dennis Jones, who taught Ojibwe culture and history. And um, if any of you know Dennis Jones, you know that he's quite the comedian. Um, and I felt immediately uh, drawn to and welcomed into his classroom. So much so that I think I spent almost every day after class just chatting it up in his office. And I'm sure he was like, well, this girl, please go away so I can get something done, right? But it was through that opportunity to build relationships with professors, with other students who look like me, that I filled up that hole. That I learned who I was as a young Native woman. And that is a gift that I can never repay to the University of Minnesota. I also had uh, a woman named Jillian Birkeland, who's now Jillian Rowan, who worked in the Office of Admissions and also worked at the Learning Resource Center, who took me under her wing and made sure that I was successful. Eventually, she asked me to come on and work in the Office of Admissions um, through the American Indian Student Outreach and Recruitment Office. And I got to talk to Native students from all across the state and all across the country about what an amazing community the University of Minnesota can provide. I'm sure a lot of you hear this when you know, folks say, oh yeah, I graduated from the U or I go to the U. Oh, but it's so big. It's only as big as you make it. There are so many opportunities that we all know to build community here. And that's what I think makes this place so unique, that it can serve so many different students. Students like myself, who thought that, frankly, that I just wasn't smart. I uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota, Phi Beta Kappa, with a degree in child psychology and a minor in American Indian Studies. I was a teaching assistant for Dennis Jones, and now I am actually a teacher uh, at George Washington University once a week, working with Native students uh, in Washington, D.C. The reason that I can do that, hey, thanks. <laughs> and it was because of my experience at the University of Minnesota that I have had this opportunity. What we're doing here in this room is so powerful. The opportunity to meet other folks in your district, the opportunity to share stories, and to know that when you write your letter, when you make that phone call, when you reach out to your representative, you're not alone. Look at all the people in this room, and there's people all across the state who are also here with us. Which reminds me, I forgot to say this, go Gophers, go Bulldogs, go Cougars, go Eagles, go Raptors. Did I get them all? Yes. All right. So after I left the U of M, I worked um, Dr. Brenda Child uh, suggested that I take a look at an organization here called the Division of Indian Work that worked with uh, Native families all across the city here in our urban community. And I ran a program called Parents Plus, which was essentially created to help bridge the gap between home and school. 
for Native families and their children. Traditionally, public education, public institutions of learning, have not been a safe place for Native students. Through boarding schools, through incredible historical trauma, boarding schools are one generation removed from my family. Through that trauma, we've got a lot of work to do. And it was sort of my job to figure out how do you help folks make that connection? To see that school is, can be a safe place, is a critical place for our young Native people to develop into who they need to be. And so through building these relationships with these families and with children, I saw that Minneapolis public schools could do a better job in serving Native students and in serving people of color. So I spent some time working with uh, Judy Farmer, who some of you may know, who had served on the school board as long as I had been alive, which I like to remind her of that, right? Um, and I built a relationship with Judy because educational issues were really important to me and to the kids that I worked with every day. And it was through that relationship that we said, man, there's never been a Native person to serve on the school board before. We should figure out who that is. So I spent about six months trying to convince people that running for the school board was a good idea. Now, it was shocking to me that Native people wouldn't jump at the chance to be part of a governmental body. We've always had such a positive relationship in the past, right? But we were over at the Indian Center on Franklin and Bloomington. It was a gathering with uh, the superintendent, with school board members, and with community members. We had a big feast and we were all there to talk about our children and how to best serve them. And there was an opportunity where folks could come up and could just speak at the open mic and uh, Clyde Bellicourt, who's an American Indian Movement veteran, gave up and gave this like incredible fiery speech, you know, with the blood of Geronimo running through our veins. And, and then they said, does anybody else want to talk? And I was like, well, how do you follow that up, right? <laughs> but I thought, this is my chance. This is sort of our last ditch effort to try to find somebody from the community to run for the school board. So I got up there and I grabbed the mic and my hand was shaking and I said, I'm sick and tired of other people making decisions for what's best for us. It's time we have a voice at the table. Talk to me if you want to run for the school board. And then I sat down. And the moral of that story is be careful what you ask for. Uh, because after that, some elders in my community and other community members said, why don't you do it? I was like, that's not what I meant. And they said, no, no, you know, every time it's election time, you come over here with your voter registration cards, you get so excited, and we're like, yeah, yeah, Peggy, we'll register to vote. Again, right? <laughs> but I thought about it. And I thought, you know, at the very least, we'll be able to have the, the issues that are most important in our community as part of the debate. Because there's no way in heck a 24-year-old Native woman living on the north side of Minneapolis without any kids will ever get elected to public office. Well, surprise, surprise, we talked to folks about what they really cared about. We knocked on doors in all the neighborhoods where people said, don't bother, because those people don't vote. And those people were me, my community. And so what you're doing here and what we're doing here together is so powerful. It's that personal connection to folks about what they care about, about what you care about, and sharing that story. I was elected with 72,000 votes, and that was because we went out and we talked to folks. We knocked on doors. And we continued to do that. I'd like to think so throughout my tenure on the board. One of the things that I'm most proud of is that we were able to create a memorandum of agreement between the American Indian community 
and the district, which talked about collectively embracing the responsibility of educating our young people, that everyone is responsible, our children for their own educations, parents, families, grandparents, the schools, and the community themselves. And so I think that's part of what we're actually doing here, saying that we are collectively responsible for the education of the students at the University of Minnesota and the well-being of folks all across the state. This is powerful stuff. Now, serving on the school board, you might guess, sometimes people get a little upset with us. And, you know, we may get phone calls, emails, letters, visits from folks. And the things that were most powerful were oftentimes handwritten letters that I knew that someone took the time to put down their own personal thoughts and share them with me. And that's why what we're doing here again is so important, to tell your own personal story. You know, working for Wellstone Action, I go all across the country and talk to folks about advocacy for things that they believe in. And what ends up happening so often is that we start talking about issues. We talk about, you know, funding higher education, closing the achievement gap. And one of my friends likes to tell me that when we talk about those issues, like I could talk about a per pupil funding formula until the cows come home, right? She said, when I hear you talk about issues, what I hear is wah, 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 right? Like one of, one of the grown ups on the Peanuts cartoons. And she, you know, she's always like, tell me what it looks like. What does it mean? And so that's my challenge for you tonight. To think about what does it mean to you that this place exists? Why does it matter? And why should the folks in St. Paul, why should they care? It's easy to brush off facts and statistics. Unfortunately, the facts alone will not set you free. But it's harder to brush aside a face and a story and connection. The only reason I am standing here is because of the fact that the University of Minnesota was willing to take a chance on me. That the educators here told me I was smart for the first time. So I know that everyone in this room has a story that is similar to mine. Why you're in this room I want you to really think about that because that is the next step. That's what we need to share with those folks just down University Avenue. Why this matters, why they should care, and why investing in the University of Minnesota is an investing in the future of the state of Minnesota overall. Now, one of the things that I also teach people is you know, we're Minnesota nice, right? Which sometimes just means passive aggressive, <laughs> okay? So, you know, it's, you know, we come from the land of where you have to ask someone if they're hungry three times or not before they can say yes. Do you know what I'm talking about? This happens in kitchens all across the state. Can I get you something to eat? No, I'm fine. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Really, it's no problem. I'm just gonna pop it in the micro, no problem. Thank you, I'm starving, right? This conversation has played out all across the state since time immemorial, right? So what I'm gonna ask you to do tonight might make you a little uncomfortable. I'm gonna actually ask you to commit. And when you talk to your legislators and when you write them a letter, 
What I need you to say is, can I count on your support? Can we count on your support to invest in the University of Minnesota? Can I count on you to invest in other people like myself? And so I've got uh, a little bit of, uh, not homework, it's actually work that we're going to do together right now. If you can go ahead and take out your folder, which you're familiar with because you all smiled beautifully, right, and held it up. And there are two things that I need you to do. The first is to take out this smaller postcard. Okay. It looks like this. And on the back side, it said, I attended the legislative briefing at the University of Minnesota on January 19th, 2011. At the briefing, I committed to do the following things in support of the University of Minnesota during the 2011 legislative session. So take a look at that list and check off all the things that you are committed to do. Email the photo I took at the legislative briefing to friends and encourage them to contact their legislators. Post the photo I took at the legislative briefing on my Facebook page or other social media sites I use. Email the PDF uh, because letter to people I know and ask them to mail it to their legislators with a message about supporting the U of M. Take blank copies of the Because postcard to, hang out to hand out to my friends. And you have a whole stack of those postcards on your table. They look like this. That if you want to bring them home or give them to other folks that you know have also been served by this institution, to just say a little bit about why and address it to their legislator. Follow up with my legislators by phone by email, in writing, or in person, and remember the more personal con the contact, the more powerful, the better the contact. Host a constituent meeting in my legislative district with my legislators. We've got some folks in place who can help you do that. Respond to legislative network action alerts, and then other, so fill in the blank. What are you willing to commit to tonight to ensure that the University of Minnesota is able to serve more people, folks like myself, in making the state a better place to be. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to do that right now. Can I count on your support to do that right now? And there are people who are going to come by and we'll pick these up. And the most important thing that I need you to do is to address this to yourself. Because we're going to send this to you in the mail. As a little reminder, right, of what you decided to commit to do. So please just take a moment to address that to yourself. So while you are filling that out and making commitments, I want to point out to you, um, up on the large screen, there's a really easy way. Maybe you're like, I don't know who my legislator is, right? Or if I give this to my sister, how is she going to know who her representative is? So here is this handy dandy tool provided by the University of Minnesota, and the website is z.umn.edu slash district finder. z.umn.edu slash district finder. Okay, so there are some nice people who are walking around, who are picking up your commitments, who are picking up your postcards. Okay, so hold them up high so they can come by and get them from you.
So you're handing in this postcard, excellent. And then there's also one of these in your folders that is addressed to your representative. You can take the time now to jot down a couple of points, a couple of thoughts, and leave it on your table and we'll come pick it up. Or you can take it home and take some time with it as long as you promise me and everyone else in here that you're going to mail it, okay? So this may be a good follow-up to the email and the picture of you that your legislator is going to receive. So you can follow up and say, hey, you got an email from me talking about why the University of Minnesota being a strong institution is so important to the future of the state. Here's my follow-up, okay? So first is a postcard, second is the bigger postcard with a little bit of a story, okay? And then you're also going to bring some postcards home to pass out to your family and friends or people on the street who are wearing U of M garb, right? As long as they have positive things to say about the University of Minnesota, we want them to talk to their legislators. All right, so it looks like folks are almost all set. It's a lot easier to do stuff like this at a university where people are like, oh, you want me to fill something out? Great. I'm used to doing that, right? Okay. So that wasn't so bad, was it? No? All right? All right, good. That's an easy thing to do. So that will be sent back to you as a reminder, right? A gentle reminder for what needs to happen, right? Especially in this legislative session that is so important. It is so important that everyone over in St. Paul hears our stories. Here's our collective stories and our individual stories about why it is so important for the university to remain a strong and vital part of our life in the state of Minnesota. Uh, so with that, um, I have the opportunity to introduce to you the president of the University of Minnesota. And oftentimes, there is a little bio that is read before um, he comes up to, to give speeches. And this one's gonna be a little different. Um, President Brunix and I have a little something in common. President Brunix was a first generation college graduate, like myself, who as a teenager, worked as a farm laborer, not like myself, <laughs> whose high school principal didn't expect him to mount to much, who dramatically switched majors in the middle of his undergraduate studies, and who went on to become a lifelong educator, scholar, and leader, and not to mention the 15th president of the University of Minnesota. For more than 40 years, he has called the University of Minnesota home, advocating for the importance of education at all levels for the students, like myself, of all backgrounds. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce to you President Robert H. Brunix. Peggy, you are fabulous. 
You really got us off to a great start. I thought when she was going to talk about how much we had in common, we were going to talk about my youthful countenance. <laughs> but we didn't get there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I think your, your story was very, very moving. And it uh, reminded me once again how really critical the University of Minnesota is um, to the future of our country, the future of our state. So I want to thank, I want to begin by thanking all of you for being here. It's, it's wonderful to have record attendance at this legislative forum. And I can tell you after testifying in the Senate today, I, uh, your efforts are going to be needed uh, more this year than perhaps ever before. Uh, we're in a tough time and we really need your help and I'll come back to that, that theme uh, uh, later. You are here to advocate and to support, to share your passion, as Peggy has indicated, for what I regard and what I think you regard is Minnesota's most essential, not just good, Minnesota's most essential educational, cultural, and economic institution, the University of Minnesota. If you look at Peggy and me, I trust you can see some obvious differences. Without a doubt, our life experiences have, are quite different. I'm sure you can see the four decades that separate us, uh, just to say the least. It's true, I grew up in rural Michigan, and my principal didn't think too highly of my academic potential or my academic future. In fact, he had a lot of recommendations for how I could spend my time, and they didn't really include the university down the, down the road. My chief interests were sports, music, Girls, and not always in that order. <laughs> it wasn't until I arrived at a place like the University of Minnesota, in my case it was Western Univer Michigan University, the place I could afford down the highway, that I realized how important it was to get serious about my studies. I fell in love with learning, and I've tried to make a life of it. And it's been a fabulous life. So there's a common thread to our stories and I suspect your stories as well. And that common thread is that we all, institutions and people, rise to the level of our expectations and rise to the level of our aspirations. Fortunately for both of us, we found people who saw our potential and more importantly, helped us to see it in ourselves. That's what we do every day at the University of Minnesota and all the campuses across the state. The same holds true for organizations. Those organizations that aim for less really settle for less. They become complacent, mediocre, and ultimately irrelevant. I'm here to tell you tonight, the University of Minnesota has never, never been more relevant to the future of Minnesota and the nation than it is today. This place was founded in 1851 as a center of education and culture for an inspiring state. In the 1920s, the university community began to consider an inscription on the facade of Northrop Memorial Auditorium, something to capture sort of the essence, if you will, or the promise of this great institution. In 1936, in the heart of the Depression, they set these words to stone, the University of Minnesota, founded in the faith that men are ennobled by understanding, dedicated to the advancement of learning and the search for truth, dedicated to the advancement of learning and the search for truth, devoted to the instruction of youth and the welfare of the state. In the midst of the Great Depression, something that was far deeper and more serious than what we're experiencing today, People recognized the beauty of human understanding, and they saw fit to have their devotion to the advancement of knowledge written on the very heart, in the very center of the University of Minnesota. They left their mark, they set their, high, their bar very high for all of us, and we have been striving to achieve it ever since. I'd like to talk a little bit about setting high aspirations for the future of the University of Minnesota. When I was inaugurated early in 2003, the Board of Regents started a great conversation in my judgment, 
and set this community on a very ambitious course. And I would say somewhat immodestly, a transformative journey to improve the university's excellence, productivity, and public impact. We called it, immodestly, transforming the University of Minnesota. The stated goal of this strategic positioning initiative was to become one of the top public university universities in the world and to set an equivalent standard for the other campuses of the University of Minnesota system. Like the Northrop inscription, this goal was obviously greeted by some skepticism, but its purpose was to set the same level of expectation for the university that our founders established in 1851 and to urge our communities to live up to our proud heritage of achievement, contribution, and public responsibility. I've said this before, we aspire to stature, not a number, not ranking. And achieving this aspiration requires, in my judgment, a deep and abiding cultural commitment to excellence in everything we do. A commitment, in my judgment, that is consistent with Minnesota's deepest values and sense of pride. It's not about arrogance. It's about deep values, deep commitments, a sense of pride. So let's consider together how far we've come in this short period of time and how we've built and strengthened the University of Minnesota. In the last six years, applications to the Twin Cities campus have nearly doubled to nearly 37,000 applications for about 5,200 slots. In that same period, we've seen steady improvements in the academic profile and preparation of incoming students and steadily climbing retention and graduation rates. Today, 91% of Twin City students continue after their first year, and four-year graduation rates have roughly doubled in the past decade. You can find similar achievement profiles on the other campuses of the University of Minnesota. Each year across the University of Minnesota, in all of our campuses, we welcome more than 2,000 transfer students at the undergraduate level from sister institutions across the state and region, and we graduate them at very, very high rates. Last year, the university granted more than 14,000 degrees. Nearly half of these degrees were in very technical fields in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and substantially higher percentages in these same fields in graduate and professional fields. In fact, 90 plus percent of the PhDs in these fields working in Minnesota industries hold degrees here from the University of Minnesota. Many of these students, regardless of where they came from, chose to stay in Minnesota. They chose to live here, to work here, and to raise their families in this great state. We are a talent magnet for Minnesota. We keep people here, and we attract very, very talented people from around the world to study with us and make a, an eventual contribution to our great state. Our system-wide focus on graduating students in a timely manner and strategies to improve online learning opportunities for students statewide are substantially increasing the university's capacity. Today, we are enrolling more students on five campuses approximately 12,500, more than we did in 2005. And I want to point out to you, we're, that's about the size of the University of Minnesota Duluth. 12,500 more students are attending University of Minnesota campuses despite very deep cuts in university resources. That tells me this is a very productive place and becoming even more productive. And we're producing significantly more degrees each and every year. We have made a deep commitment to financial aid to keep higher education financially accessible and affordable for our students. The University of Minnesota Promise Scholarship Program alone provides substantial need-based scholarship support to all low and middle income undergraduates on our five campuses. Approximately 13,000 students total from Minnesota families earning up to $100,000 a year benefit from this very program. Thanks to generous internal and donor support, today the university provides nearly $80 million in scholarship and grant support for our students, more than the state and federal governments combined. That is a, an extraordinary record of commitment to keeping the doors of educational opportunity available to young people in our state. 
As a result of these innovative strategies, our other need-based and merit-based scholarships and grants, and federal and state aid programs, the average price, the average price uh, for Minnesota students, the price they pay to attend the University of Minnesota has increased just 3% a year over the past nine years. That's a very important thing for you to take away from this meeting. We have really kept the cost of education down for students. You can't just look at sticker price any more you, than you can in an automobile uh, showroom. Through scholarships and financial aid, on average, the cost of tuition and fees has gone up about three, the cost of education, including room, board, and housing, has gone up around 3% a year. The nominal rate of tuition has gone up, but students have received extraordinary levels of support. The scholarship support has more than doubled in the last few years, and the size of the awards per student have doubled in this period of time as well. Already ranked among the top 10 research universities in the United States today, in 2010, the university garnered a record $823 million in outside funding and contributed to the launching of eight new companies, seven of them in the state of Minnesota. Since 2004, the university's research portfolio has grown by 41% significantly outperforming our peers. And our 2010 total represents double-digit growth over last year, even when you remove the impact of federal stimulus dollars. As you've no doubt heard, as the economy has declined in the past few years, the mantra of our public officials is jobs, 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 jobs. I happen to agree. But if the university wants to create jobs, it has an extraordinary responsibility to support the U. You can't have one without the other. $823 million in outside research money creates jobs in Minnesota, and we conservatively estimate more than 25,000 jobs per year. That is why I sincerely believe that the university is one of the state's best investments to grow jobs and create a strong economic future for our state. Every January, the university presents a new semester with new possibilities. This particular January also presents us with a new governor, a new legislative majority, 60 new members, of the House and Senate out of 220 or 201 members, and new ideas to spark economic growth and meet the needs of our great state. Minnesota, I don't have to tell you, faces a projected budget shortfall of more than $6 billion. It is imperative that all of us work together to make the case for strong support for the university to our state leaders and our fellow citizens. I think we also need to recognize that some of this heavy lifting has to occur here. We have to do our part as well, and we have done so. This legislation, or this legislative session, will determine the university's biennial budget, that is for the next two years, our level of state funding uh, for the foreseeable future. During the last session, the legislature saw fit to make higher education uh, a priority, and they increased the university's what we call forecasted budget by about $50 million a year. Knowing the economic challenges the state still faces, the university's biennial request is very simple. We want to maintain this budget base, and we're asking to maintain it to increase investments in vitally needed student aid, financial aid, new faculty positions to advance the, the education and research mission of the University of Minnesota and meet the rising core costs that we face each and every year. We think this request is reasonable, but I think achieving this request is going to be difficult, if not impossible. I want to also take a minute to talk about our federal budget. When we have this meeting every year, we generally ask you to support the work of the university in the state legislature. I think we need to ask you also to help us support our federal agenda. 
I told you about our faculty researchers, our faculty and staff who bring in $823 million. To put that in perspective, the state of Minnesota invested in the university $592 million this year. It's a lot of money, but not, not as much as you think when you think about how that money is leveraged. For every dollar the state invested, we brought four and a half dollars of new economic activity uh, into this uh, state. But anyway, that's one of the things we're deeply worried about. And more than a quarter of our students, 10,000 of our undergraduates, now receive something called the Pell Grant or other forms of federal support. Many more rely on federally subsidized loans uh, to help finance their education. Leaders of the House in particular have signaled they, they are looking to make cuts in the federal uh, Pell program for low-income students or students from low-income families. And they're also talking about making deep cuts in the National Institutes of Health and other uh, federal funding priorities uh, that uh, uh, go to the heart of supporting long-term research and development in the United States. They have ruled out cutting defense spending and Social Security. But I'm deeply worried about these cuts because if you combine potential deep federal reductions in research and innovation, I don't see how the country can really uh, maintain a solid course uh, to develop the economy of the 21st century, one that is going to be based increasingly on high levels of education and research innovation, the creation of ideas, if you will. So we may also be getting in touch with you to ask for your help uh, with the congressional delegation. We need to get the point across to people that given the high tech profile of the state of Minnesota and what goes on here at the university, it's vitally important to maintain this very, very special partnership the university and all universities like us in the United States has enjoyed since the end of World War II. We're talking about changing a 60 plus year partnership between government in education to really advance the agenda of the United States. And I think it's a very, very serious threat, not only to the university's future, but also the future of our economy and quality of life. So what can you do? Peggy, I think, put it better than I will, but I'm going to try to see if I can meet her standard. You need to tell your legislators, your friends, neighbors, you need to tell everyone that the university matters to the state's future. It matters to Minnesota's future. And you need to be sure you tell them in very personal terms. You need to tell them how the university matters to you personally and what kind of impact you've seen the university achieve in the lives of our students and in the vitality of our communities. Then when you finish, I want you to tell them again. So you tell them once and you tell them again. And then I want you to remind them that you told them before. I want you to be really persistent. We need to get this across. More than any of, the, any of the 42 years I've been here, we need to really work to define what makes the university distinctive, why it's important to the future of our state, why it really matters. I will tell you, you can cut a lot of things in the, universe, in the state of Minnesota. But if you really deeply wound the University of Minnesota, you are compromising the future of this state. And you have to go out and help us get this message across to people. This is going to be difficult. This is a difficult time for communities, for families, for businesses. But we want the university to be in the discussion. One of the things I do on occasion when public officials are running for office and they're telling me why I should vote for them, I look at what their priorities are. And we have had people running for major offices in the state of Minnesota who would never, who never list higher education as a priority. The jobs of Minnesota's future, 70% of them, according to a recent economic study by George Washington University, 70% of those jobs are going to require a college education. Minnesota's future can't survive without an investment in higher education. It needs to be placed on the priority list. Other things matter? I agree. We have to solve a lot of our problems? I agree. But you can't have a great future without a great University of Minnesota. So we want, we, we want to be a part of balancing this budget, dealing with the problems, 
But I think we need to remind people that the future of our state depends fundamentally on developing a culture of innovation and supporting the education of our people. According to Aristotle, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but it's a habit. We have set aggressive goals in critical areas of our mission and our responsibilities. We have established here at the university concrete measures of progress. We have achieved ex an extraordinary rate of comparative growth on the things that really matter here at the University of Minnesota in our mission-related areas of responsibility. And for the past six years, we have delivered on our mission, moving closer to the bar we set so high uh, to keep us stretching and stretching ever increasingly to build a strong University of Minnesota. We've achieved this while balancing a budget by reducing costs and increasing productivity in every aspect of our operations. Well, we can be justifiably proud of what we have achieved. We clearly need your energy. We clearly need your commitment. We need your commitment to preserve these critical gains. These have been hard-won gains here at the University of Minnesota. We need you to help us protect the university's strength and vitality. We need you to help us strengthen Minnesota's long-term future. I want to close my remarks by recalling one of Minnesota's great statements, statesmen the late Elmer L. Anderson. Many of you remember uh, Governor Anderson. He was the governor of Minnesota for two years, between 1961 and 1963. He was a Republican and fiscal conservative who worked across the aisles to do great things for Minnesota. And the U was near and dear to his heart. From 1967 to 1975, he served on the Board of Regents and he chaired the board from 1972 through 1975. From 1968 to 1988, 20 years, he served as a University of Minnesota Foundation trustee and he chaired that board for a three-year uh, period in the late 70s. Governor Anderson recognized the critical role this institution plays in the future of our state. And no one, and I mean no one, knew better the importance of setting high aspirations and, as expressed by one of his favorite quotes from the poet Robert Browning. And he used to quote this very often in conversations with his friends and people he met. Browning once wrote, ah, but a man's reach should exceed his gra grass, or what's a heaven for? We must remind ourselves and our state leaders that we are driven by great expectations by our aspirations to be something more than we are today. This is not about a race to the bottom. This is about reaching for the stars. Together we can ensure that Minnesota remains emblematic of the best our nation has to offer. That's our task, that's our job, that's our challenge. And I want to end by thanking you once again for being here. I want to thank you for your deep commitment to the future of this great university in our state. And I want to thank you most of all for your steadfast support for the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy and President Brunex, for your inspiring stories and reminding us of the importance of places like University of Minnesota. Those of you in attendance last year may remember writing letters to your legislators. Last year, over 400 letters were delivered to the Capitol as a result of your action. How many of you had your picture taken this evening? Let me see a show of hands, please. Thank you. Can I count on you to support the UFM, as Peggy said? Yes. I didn't hear. Yes. Thank you. They say a picture paints a thousand words, and in the next few days, your legislators are going to receive photos of their constituents who attend this evening in a web page personalized for their district. Within the next couple of days, you are going to receive a copy of your photo by email. Your next steps are simple, and I encourage you to do it, please. First, pass that photo on to your friends, relatives, and neighbors. 
Post it on the social networking sites you use. Follow up with your legislators by writing on the postcards in your folder. Take blank postcards with you to pass out to your friends and encourage them to write. Share your story about the importance of the UFM within your circles of influence. Before you go, you'll find an evaluation form in your folder. Please complete it and leave it on your table. If you have already written out your postcard, you can leave that on the table as well. And for those of you who place your coats in the gateway room on your way in, you can exit through the center hallway on your way out. Let's keep the momentum you feel here tonight building and let Minnesotans know that the UFM impacts everyone, even if they have never stepped foot on a campus of ours. Have a good night, a safe drive home, and keep up the great work in support of the University of Minnesota and higher education. Thank you for coming. Go Gophers. Say, before we go, we got one more thing to do. I got a request from one of the leading members of our Board of Regents that we should sing the Minnesota Rouser. What do you say? All right, let's get up. <laughs> All right, ready to go? Minnesota, hats off to thee. To thy colors true we shall ever be firm and strong, united are we. Hurrah, rah, rah for Sky Yuma. Rah, 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 rah for the U of M. Minnesota, hats off to thee. To thy colors true we shall ever be firm and strong, united are we. Hurrah, rah, rah for Sky Yuma. Rah, 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 rah for the U of M. M. I N N E S O T A Minnesota Minnesota Yeah Golfers Yeah <laughs>